Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Fifty years of outdoor concerts have seen artists progress from performing in parking lots on the decks of flatbed trucks to performing in modern sports stadia on spectacularly elaborate custom-built stages. The positive reaction to Elvis Presley's performance at the Jacksonville Gator Bowl in 1955 marked the beginning of a trend towards larger and larger outdoor concerts that culminated with the half-million audience at Woodstock in 1989. This trend was made possible by the simultaneous development of four parallel phenomena. The emergence of artists with a massive audience of fans amongst the post-war baby boom generation. The readiness of fans to see artists perform in non-traditional entertainment venues. The rise of a new generation of concert promoters who were prepared to gamble on bringing artists and audiences together in concerts of unprecedented size. In 1956, when Elvis Presley was performing on flatbed trucks, his president, Eisenhower, launched the construction of the interstate freeway system, described at the time as the largest public works program since the pyramids. The construction of the freeway system democratized freight movement in the continental USA. Anyone with a truck could move anything, more or less anywhere, very quickly. And this major investment in the USA made it possible for the invention of the rock and roll tour. The first stadium concert that is really seen as the start of all of this was the Beatles in Shea Stadium in 1965. And it is very different to the way that concerts are done today. It was a total one-off experiment by the promoter to see if he could get enough people to come and buy tickets to the stadium, which they duly did. They used the house PA which must have sounded terrible, except for the fact that there was so much screaming that nobody could hear anything anyway. <laughs> in four short years after that, we get to Woodstock, where half a million people gathered. And this is really the beginning of my interest in this stuff, because at Woodstock, they were basically on farmland in the middle of nowhere, and they had to provide all of the infrastructure to support the show, including provide the structure to hold up the PA, structure to keep the rain off and things like that. But very shortly after Woodstock, the crazy bunches of hippies who were working on this stuff had managed to formulate a reasonably simple construction that could become the basic roof for a rock and roll stage. And you see here Led Zeppelin at a concert in Oakland in 1973, two massive towers of scaffolding standing either side of a stage, a flat roof that can be built on the stage, the roof was covered, still at stage level, and then lifted up into the air using chain motors that were attached to the scaffolding. The big disadvantage was that all of the loads appeared on the two lines of scaffolding that were closest to the stage, so the actual ability of this thing to take heavy weights was extremely limited. It also meant that the stage was basically a box, it was a proscenium stage in, in effect, and I was fortunate in falling in with a bunch of musicians who thought that this was a pretty boring way of going about life. And um, Pink Floyd in 1977 decided to do away with the roof altogether. The stage that they used for their 1977 tour replaced the roof with retractable umbrellas. But the big idea of the Pink Floyd show is exemplified in this picture of just a massive environmental <clears throat> statement that dominates the whole of the stadium. And it was this highly aspirational um, endeavor that attracted me to this rather curious life. At the same time as Pink Floyd were doing this um, very large scale environmental work, the sort of stage that I showed you earlier was still dominating most of the touring world. This is the Electric Light Orchestra in Toronto at the same time. And four years later, with the Rolling Stones in Leeds in 1981, again, exactly the same type of roof with basically 
a bit of customized decoration down the front. It was not until 1989 that I was able to get to grips with the Rolling Stones' um, desire to do something different. And instead of forming a box to contain the show, the design turned the stage box inside out. The weather protection and the PA structures became expressive elements of the architecture. The scenic structure extended across the full width of every stadium, turning stadiums into opera houses for rock and roll. The scenic structures provided support for lighting and pyrotechnics. And even though the stage structure looked very different from a, an early 1970s scaffolding box, the large scaffolding structures were basically holding up scenery in a very similar way. And about that time, a company in Belgium started to build a regular coffee table box roof, but using trusses and masts that they custom built for the purpose. The big idea behind this was it allowed them to lift a lot more weight up over the stage because the bands that were touring now were wanting to work with heavier weights, more lights, more scenery, <clears throat> and it was impossible to carry these loads on the scaffolding masses that were built either side of the stage. I got involved with you two around this time, and with Brian, and the big idea behind the Zoo TV tour was to create an absolute saturation bombardment of the audience with projected video. And it seemed to me that the easiest way to do some of this would be to use these, these truss and mast components to build the frames into which we would insert the video screens. The scaffolding on either side of the stage holding the PA was built by the Egyptian method, which was still popular at the time. But the video screens, as I said, were built as goalpost frames using the rented trusses and masts that had previously been developed for this new form of stage roof. This was all very well, but it also introduced to engineers and to myself the reality of doing this kind of thing in a hurry, which is that it is extremely difficult to join large pieces of steel together 18 meters up in the air and time consuming and also occasionally dangerous. And so we carried away from this tour a lot of lessons about how not to do things. It's in the nature of this kind of project that the lessons of how not to do things are rather resonant because you don't only get to make the mistake once, you get to make the mistake a hundred times. <clears throat> and if, like me, you're the designer who everybody regards with deep suspicion anyway, um, you get to go to site and be reminded of the fact um, that you have made this mistake and that they are painstakingly putting up with it and that the bar is just over there and you might like to meet them afterwards. <laughs> so from there, this uh, series of experiments went on to the next Rolling Stones tour in 94 with Voodoo Lounge, where again we took these masts and trusses and managed with greater success to build a very large flowing back wall of light and some disengaged loudspeaker towers. But we also discovered there's more to life than actually trying to pull your cladding panels up high into the air, because again, it's the same sort of thing. It all looks terribly good when you're sitting around in the design studio. But if you're trying to do this kind of stuff in the wind and rain in a hurry, it really is no fun at all. And so we took that on board as a lesson to um, take forward. But by 94, which was the date of this um, Pink Floyd tour, the division bell, the logistical and manpower aspects of large touring shows were settling into an operating pattern that prevails to this day. The driving force behind the operation is labor costs. The technicians who build and operate the shows are well paid. A typical large production aims to deliver between three and four shows per week in different cities to pay the bills. This is achieved by having three sets of the basic rental steel structure. On any day of the week, one structure is in use, one structure is being built in the next city, and the other is being taken down and moved from the previous city. A universal kit of parts, called the universal production, containing all the lights, video, sound, and scenery, travels to every city accompanied by a specialist crew. It therefore arrives in the city 
when the substructure has been completed and has to be put up very fast. This arrangement maximizes the use of rental components, uses the crews efficiently, and allows the artist to perform up to four times a week. The 94 stage for Pink Floyd featured a polygonal arch that was supporting a projection screen and lighting, and which was used as a projection surface itself. The rear projection screen here is 10 meters in diameter, and it was a cine projection screen because in 94, we're still in the days before LED screens. The uh, arch itself was built from repurposed mast and truss elements, and putting to work a lot of the lessons that I'd learned on the earlier excursions with these things, I came up with a way of building the arch effectively close to the ground on the stage, and then the cranes would lift it up until it hinged into place. By 97, LED technology was getting to the point where it was feasible to propose to U2 that they might build a video screen entirely the width of their stage. This is 50 meters wide and 15 meters high. The challenge was where to find such a screen because at that time there were none in manufacture. So we went and basically built the screen by hand. And because this was U2 and this was all about disco and a kind of satire on consumerism, we had a nice uh, mirrorball lemon that the band were able to emerge from on a good night and get stuck in on a bad night. Um, the video screen itself, which we'd had to build from scratch, folded up like a concertina, zigzag style, unfolded and was lifted into place. And the actual elements of the screen itself were, as I say, handmade by lots of happy Belgians sitting around with soldering irons for quite a long time. This is the Rolling Stones in the same year as U2. So you can see now, um, whatever we are, 40 years after Elvis, these things are beginning to get quite big. Um, this is uh, a structure, again, based on rental components, but with 24-meter high curtains. The curtains opened, and we had a large explosion to make sure that the American audiences would know where the band was. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, they always come on late, and they've had a lot of beers by then. That's always the problem. And then we would open the curtains further and strip down the stage. But the high point of it for me um, was the eponymous bridge that uh, cantilevered 50 meters from the main stage to a small stage in the middle of the stadium. And there are things about the bridge that um, I could talk about for a night, but... Um, Suffice it to say that the first two shows, uh, the bridge was not there, um, something that was noted by the singer, <coughs> who, <coughs> who wasted no time to point this out to the mass audiences who um, were naturally very disappointed. And <coughs> the reason for that was when I went and tested it in a, uh, in a factory in West London about... 24 hours before it was due to be stuck in an aeroplane and shipped over to Chicago for the first show, it broke. And we had a rather intense uh, couple of days fixing it before we managed to get it to Charlotte, North Carolina, where this photograph was taken, showing the bridge cantilevering out and the stage, the B stage, that would rise up from the middle of the, uh, of the stadium to meet it. We then went on in 2005 to build another extravagant Rolling Stone stage. This time, the big idea was that it would be in some way connected loosely to an Italian opera house with boxes, and the boxes would be behind the stage, and the boxes would be occupied by people who would pay a fabulous amount of money for the privilege <coughs> of watching the band from behind. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask how they achieve this kind of miracle. But, um, and we used the whole structure to cover it with fireworks so that, again, in that other very important queue, we could let the audience know when the show was over. <laughs> so here you see the steelwork being clad with the balconies. And these balconies are part of the scenic elements that travel with the production. So these balconies basically arrive typically 6, 7 o'clock on the evening before the show, and even in some extreme cases on the, on the morning of the show at 6 or 7 in the morning. And the whole thing gets put up in time to let the audience in by 5 or 6 o'clock at night. 
This pattern became the model for all Turing productions, and it's here that it reached its um, zenith, I think. It's debatable whether anyone will try and do anything as crazy as this again. Um, with the U2 360 tour, the legs of the structure are 60 meters apart. The structure itself weighs about 180 tons, but loaded into it on the day of show are over 200 tons of equipment that make up, amongst other things, the fabulous uh, Chuck Hoberman-designed expanding LED video screen that we built. And this became an astonishing backdrop for the um, band to work with, as well as when it's in its closed position, providing a uh, very nice high-resolution video screen. And by about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, all that 200 tons has come down, gone into trucks, and is on its way someplace else. Which, I have to admit, is not very green, but that's not really the agenda with this sort of enterprise. Um, it is, however, incredibly interesting and challenging, and it's invisible. The thing that I think all of us designers share is the pleasure that what we do means a lot to us. We all understand it, we can all talk about it, but the audience don't care about the fact that this amazing stuff goes on in the background. They go there to see the band, they have a good time, and that, in the end, is what my work has been about. Thank you. Thank you.